Our next speaker. Uh, so Jonathan Berry is a maker of all sorts with an affinity for robots, uh, APIs, and open source. Uh, by day he works making Android and iOS SDKs easier to use, and by night he can found uh, trying to get PID controllers to work the way they're supposed to. Uh, recently he contributed to a book called Make JavaScript Robotics, which is printed under Maker Media uh, in 2015. Please welcome to the stage Jonathan Berry. Uh, no. Nope. Yeah, that's. Mike, get thirsty. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Mike. Some UI issues. I must have pushed a button. No worries. As long as the Jolly Rancher comes back. All right, cool. All right. Thanks very much. All right, uh, so I'm speaking about motor control, uh, and actually a pragmatic guide to motor control. Um, I also uh, quoted a song from a very popular movie, Madagascar. I'm not going to sing it, but uh, have it in your head for the rest of the talk. <coughs> so I had a nice intro, but a little bit more about me. Um, first of all, you can find me on the internet uh, under Berry Berry Kicks on GitHub and uh, Twitter. Um, that's the serial, not the immune deficiency. And uh, Jonathan Barry everywhere else on Hackaday.io, Google+, uh, Instructables. I, I proudly call myself a maker, and I like that name. But uh, I've been doing it since uh, we used to just call ourselves nerds. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's good to see it coming um, back full swing. Uh, I am not a professional uh, electronics engineer, firmware designer um, by day, but uh, I've been tickering. And uh, yeah, I wrote a, a part of a book called uh, JavaScript Robotics, it's about um, using higher level programming languages to, uh, to interact with the world um, with different mo microcontrollers and embedded systems. So here's a brief overview of my talk uh, and the agenda for the next uh, 20 or so minutes. Um, kind of why I started this talk is where I want to begin. Um, my plan of actually developing the talk, because that's interesting uh, in and of itself. Uh, and then start going into motors. Um, the things that you have to think about as a pro programmatic uh, motor control expert. Um, and then kind of going through the different uh, types of motors out there. Um, brush DC, stepper, servo, uh, ending off with brushless. Uh, it looks like the last part of my slide is cut off, but uh, kind of where I'm going to go next, um, where I'm going to continue with this information. Cool, so uh, why did I do this talk? Uh, I admitted that I wasn't a professional engineer. I'm also not a motor control expert. So I kind of have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I know more than I did a few weeks ago. Um, I, I've been building uh, robotics uh, projects, um, big and small, for a long time, helping people build their Maker, uh, Maker Fair demos or uh, Burning Man exhibits. And I had a lot of knowledge built up, but no means could I communicate that with a group of 200 people. So I thought this talk would be a great uh, forcing function to, to get a little bit more wise. And uh, we'll see if it worked. So what was my plan for this talk? <clears throat> I, um, I really wanted to focus on the pragmatic uh, pieces you need to know, especially if you're not in the, the mechan me mechatronic side of things, so the TLDR control. Uh, focused on the most common types of motors you might want to use for uh, a, you know, a Burning Man project or even a robot. So brush DC motors, steppers, servos, and brushless. Um, and I decided to cut out a lot of stuff including other types of motors, um, closed loop control, um, kinematics, things like that. Um, and that's, that's probably a whole other talk that I could probably do at the next Supercon. <clears throat> All right, so let's start talking about motors. When it comes to motors, there's a lot of attributes that you have to consider. If you have a high-end motor, you'll get this nice data sheet, just like, looks like a parts data sheet. 
And there's a lot of information. Um, I've highlighted sort of the key things that I, I care about um, when I'm uh, advising somebody on a, on a motor project. Um, the type of shaft you use, if it's slotted, if it's round, will affect um, the type of uh, connectors you'll connect to it. Obviously, the cost. Um, different types of motors have a different overall cost. Availability and sourceability. Oh, I think I have a laser pointer. Uh, ooh, cool. Um, availability and sourceability are, are actually pretty key. Because um, while you can go out and buy a particular type of motor that meets your exact um, hardware requirements, you may not be able to buy it as an individual. Um, really high-end motors that are used in research and labs or advanced uh, you know, in space, um, you can't buy one, you can't buy 10. They won't even talk to you um, unless you're a big company doing a big order. So sourceability becomes a key. Can you buy it on AliExpress? Can you get it from uh, you know, a, a distributor in the US? Then from the uh, actual design part of you, ooh, over there, uh, the stall, current, and torque are, are pretty critical. That's what happens if you grab the motor shaft and you hold it and, and it spikes. Right? The, the maximum draw it's going to draw and that maximum power it can push out um, in order. That's sort of your threshold, your upper threshold, and you can work around. Um, and the last is operating voltage. There's a lot of drivers out there that are uh, electronic control drivers um, that have different voltage ranges. So if you have a low power system, you may not be able to actually drive it with the particular part you've got. So uh, paying attention to those um, is critical. Also, if your system is a high voltage system versus a low voltage system, um, you got to keep that in consideration. The other stuff is super important, and you'll probably need to know about it if you become an expert or building something with high tolerances. But from a pragmatic point of view, um, you, can, uh, you don't have to worry about it. So. Cool. So let's start talking about the first type of motor, the most common type of motor. Brush DC motor. Um, we've all seen that even in, in, you know, in high school. It's little stumps with tiny little toothpicks sticking out of it. Uh, they're often called hobby motors because they're super cheap, easy to interface, and are used in hobby projects or toys, or sometimes called toy motors as well. Um, and they're one of the easiest to work with. So some of the pros, I mentioned the cost. Cheapest one we'll look at today. Um, it's pretty easy to get it moving. Huge range of form factors. Um, I actually blogged a lot of this on Hackaday.io, and I have um, some really interesting pictures of 90-degree uh, ones or uh, turned ones that reverse directions, uh, pancake ones. Um, so depending on the, the actual application, you can fit it in. Um, different types of power ratios. You can get a huge range for low power, um, low weight, and all, all the way up to high torque. And uh, the sort of additional stuff that I'm not going to cover, like gears and encoders, um, they're readily available. And even uh, you can buy it pre-attached uh, to the actual motor. So it's really cool. Now, there's a cons, of course. Um, brushed DC motors have brushes. Uh, and those can wear out. So for uh, you know, industrial applications that need to um, turn, that might not be the best option. They do make brushed motors that have replaceable brushes, which I'd probably put that on a, a pro. Um, so actually. Drills and stuff uh, will come with brushes. Um, they're not as precise as some other options. So if you really need to know the exact angle you're turning your brush motor um, without additional electronics, it's not going to really work out for you. And they tend to be on the heavier side. They have these, um, as they grow bigger, they have bigger magnets. And they, they're not great for, like, let's say, drones. Cool. Um, brush DC motors, and actually motors in general, are you think of it as a voltage-sensitive device. You apply enough voltage across it, it'll start moving. You apply a little bit more, it'll start moving faster. You swap the voltage, it'll start moving the other direction. You remove the power, it'll start spinning freely. It's called freewheeling. You'll see that in data sheets. Um, and if you need to stop the motor quickly, sometimes called braking, um, you can do that too. Uh, it's not a very elegant uh, way on DC motors, but you just dissipate energy um, from that motor. Now, it's super simple to control these, and uh, you know, <laughs> If you're building a fan and you don't care about very much uh, speed or control, just put a pot on it, right? Um, control that voltage. As long as it's within the operating voltage of that um, DC motor, it'll start spinning. Get a switch on it. You can reverse directions. And now you have uh, sort of the, the two main control um, requirements. Uh, I, this is a, a little known uh, application of a rotary switch, but you can have a rotary switch with a bunch of different resistive uh, voltages instead of a pot. And now you have a off, slow, fast. Um, it's a simple, simple technique that often gets overlooked for more advanced solutions. <clears throat> Moving forward to more sophisticated control is the humble H-bridge. 
Um, if, if you've ever built anything with motors, uh, you've seen this, you've probably learned this in school. Um, but if it's not, it's just four transistors that by alternating which ones you activate will flow current in one direction. So in this animated GIF, uh, you can see that we turn on the upper left and the lower right, and the, the voltage goes one way, and you swap them. So the upper right and lower left, now you get that reverse voltage. So that's the basics of directionality. You can um, enable those with a whole bunch of different means that we'll look into. And uh, depending on your power requirements, you can use different types of transistors, right? Like simple bipolar transistors, uh, tiny 222s, um, are great for low voltage, low power draw. And if you need heavier stuff, just throw a MOSFET on it. Um, there's a song in there too, I think. Uh, but don't forget a heat sink, because they can actually um, uh, get really warm. And we'll see this pattern over and over again um, in the other types of motor controls. So they actually make H-bridges on a chip. Um, this is a really popular uh, L298. Um, every maker kit uh, in the world probably has that if it has some motor controller. It actually has two H-bridges inside if you look at the data sheet. Um, so you can control two DC motors um, and enable those, that, that control. On the Hackaday I.O. site, I give a lot more uh, examples of different controllers you can use for different applications. Um, or drivers, rather. Now, where can we get that variable voltage? Well, it's, it's the PWM. PWM um, simulates voltage change. So if you're doing a speed controller for a fan, you don't care, use a 555. It's an easy to implement and give you a nice uh, speed control. Um, you still need that H-bridge um, if you want to oscillate it or, uh, sorry, reverse it or switch it again. If you look at some really cheap fans, they'll have 555s in the back. But really the interesting thing is, for the folks in this room, I'm using uh, microcontrollers and more sophisticated drivers. If you look over here, we can just use any sort of uh, microcontroller that can generate a PWM, throw a MOSFET on it, and now we can switch it on or off, throw an H-bridge on it, now we can have our full directionality. They do make really fancy, uh, fancy uh, DC drivers, um, which are a little bit more sophisticated than uh, doing an H-bridge. You can just supply a, a PWM and a digital pin, and it'll do the reversing for you. So uh, they cost a little more, um, but they also save you um, complexity in your code and uh, um, save some, on some pins. <clears throat> now, what if you have to control a lot of DC motors? Well, uh, they sell parts that are multi-channel PWM generators, because you're going to run out of PWMs eventually on, uh, in most motion controllers. Uh, this is actually a screenshot of, uh, of an added fruit board for, uh, I wrote this down, PCA9685. It's a 16-channel um, uh, PWM generator that can be used for LEDs, but it can also be used for H-bridges and therefore DC server motors. Um, these are actually ITC controls, so you can chain them together. Uh, I think it's a 16-channel, and it can daisy-chain up to 64, so you can actually control 900-plus DC motors from one, you know, like 80 tiny which is pretty neat. Um, you just got to make sure that if you're doing DC, not server, like pictured here, you throw a bunch of H-bridges on each one of those. And again, depending on your power requirements, you can use bipolar or MOSFET. So that's, that's DC. Now let's go to stepper. Stepper motors, really complex if you open up on the inside. But at the end of the day, um, they're precisionly controlled. You can get a very finite uh, angle out of them. They're continuous revolution. You can go other directions. And they're getting so cheap these days because of 3D printers. They're found in every 3D printer you, you buy on the market today. Um, they also have industrial applications. Robotic arms use these a lot um, because of that position, uh, positional accuracy. Going over the pros, um, they're a little bit more than DC because they got a lot more winding and, and technology inside. Um, but printers are bringing them down. So you can get them really cheap from China. Um, you can rotate them to a very precise degree. Um, you'll see micro-stepping mentioned uh, on the internet. Um, that's where you get those uh, tiny controls. Uh, great, great number of controllers. You can use it with an MCU. Um, and they actually are standardized sizes for the most part. There's a NEMA standard for NEMA 17, NEMA 21. Um, on the cons, they can actually get really expensive. Uh, high precision, high torque, cost a lot of money. They're, again, heavy, uh, heavier than some other options. And uh, they got a lot of coils inside, which can draw a lot more power than um, a similar application. <clears throat> so as a pragmatic motor controller expert now, it's really just two DC motors. 
Um, it's two sets of coils that you have to excite in a certain pattern to, to help that, uh, that magnet go around. The, uh, go around. Um, you can also notice that this is uh, exciting uh, a coil next to each other. So it helps it progress in sort of a clockwise. When I see it, I think of the old Simon game, you know, the one you light up and you dance, dance around. Um, there, this is really important. Is, is, uh, one thing you'll notice, there's two coils adjacent, causes the motor to be halfway between it. So that's a, called a half-stepping. Um, and you can get smaller and smaller, and you can vary the amount of uh, power you apply to each coil, so you can get um, gradients in between. So that's where you get that nice, skin, the smooth position. You also get braking for free, because as long as it's on, it just stops, versus you actually have to force it to brake, like our DC um, example before. <clears throat> so you can control steppers with DC, DC uh, sorry, discrete components. Um, a 555 and a flip-flop will help it um, toggle along. Um, if you just want to turn it like a fan, this is the way to do it. Um, and again, we can use our H-bridge to get more power out of it, or you know, transistors to drive it. Um, <clears throat> But really, uh, you see most applications are going to use an MCU um, with a driver. OK, I'm running out of time here. Um, you can use a driver just like that L L298 we saw before. Because it was like it can drive two DC motors, now you can drive a single stepper with that one pair. Um, and there are fancier drivers that will take a single uh, PWM and uh, a, a directional control. Servos is kind of the black sheep. Um, it was born out of the hobby uh, RC plane market. Um, but they're really cheap, and they have actually uh, controls on the inside, so we have to do less, um, less on the outside. Super cheap. Um, what's unique about them is you can tell them which angle to go to, and they'll stay there, and they'll even fight to stay there. So if there's resistance, it'll, it'll provide more power. So it's, it's a closed-loop system on the inside. Um, really nice uh, casing, so they're usually easy to mount. And uh, they really work well with LiPos, because they're designed for RC World, so it's great for projects that use LiPos. The cons. It can get really expensive if they're industrial servos. I mean, really expensive in the thousands. Um, they're not meant for continuous rotation, but there's sort of hacky um, implementations of that. And uh, it requires a constant signal to keep that position up. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> How does it do it? Well, you supply a PWM at a certain uh, frequency um, with a certain duty cycle. It's not meant for engineers, so they talk about periods in milliseconds instead of the actual percentages, but that's fine. Uh, a standard hobby servo at um, 1.5 milliseconds will be upright, like that top diagram. Um, if you provide it two milliseconds, it'll go the other way, and uh, one um, the other way. So you can build a simple a servo tester with a 555, but that's not really useful. Um, you can just use a microcontroller that generates a PWM. Because it has an onboard controller, um, it manages its own power, and uh, it's really easy to interface with, as long as you pro provide enough uh, current from an external battery source. The last motor we're going to look at is brushless, uh, and that's what you find in drones today. Um, they have gone down in price significantly because of the, the, the rise of the, that technology and the hobby, um, but also in e-bikes, because um, they can actually generate a lot of torque at high speeds. So price is dropping um, considerably, um, thanks to um, drones and bikes. Uh, they're actually easy to control thanks to uh, things like electronic speed controllers from drones, and I have some here. Um, and they're super lightweight. They don't do fixed positioning. They require a lot more sophisticated uh, controllers, though you can buy those off the shelf. And um, they're more, they can be more efficient, but they can drain a lot of power. I mean, drones have like, what, 10 minutes for hobby drones of flight time? So no surprise, there's a pragmatic way to look at them. And you can look at them as three coils, just like the stepper was two uh, DC motors. Uh, brushless uh, roughly is three. Um, and if you look at the diagram, you just alternate again, cycle through the different coils, and we'll keep the, the, the shaft spinning. And uh, again, pulse width is what drives that. And if you look at some of these uh, electronic speed controllers, uh, you probably can't see from there. But on one side is a microcontroller, like an 8051 or an Atmega. And on the other side is just a bunch of MOSFETs. So it's just another H-bridge with a microcontroller. It just so happens you can buy it off the shelf. Um, there's even folks who uh, write custom firmware for the ESC so you can have more sophisticated um, and more, uh, more options with the controller. <clears throat> All right, so that was the whirlwind of pragmatic control. I mentioned some parts. I have um, some demos, so afterwards we can, uh, we can take a look at and ask me some questions. Um, 
But I got some plans for the future. Uh, first of all, all this, this deck has been online for the last few days, because I actually developed the whole talk on Hackett.io. I did in long form, have more samples, things like that. Um, and you can, you can read up and uh, ask me questions on there. I did want to talk about AC, um, uh, AC motors, solenoids, and smart servos, which is a whole other beast. But uh, I didn't have time, so I'm going to finish that up online. Um, and there's some code. Uh, I've written uh, samples on Arduino. It's fine. Um, but I've been playing a lot with uh, Chibi OS, the real time, uh, the RTOS, that has a really nice HAL. So I'll include the, the code up there. And uh, I have enough content for at least one closed loop talk. Um, so maybe I'll just do it on hackaday.io and, and talk to the, the computer screen. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much. So we're going to actually. Oh, yeah. Let's have one more round of applause for Jonathan Barry. Thanks so much. Thank you. So, uh, thank you so for much. all your motor needs or questions about any of the drivers or setups that you have, uh, please join him for the question and answer. He is also the author of a book called JavaScript Robotics. So if you're interested in that, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk about it. We're actually moving the question and answer area right through the doors where registration was so that you can be a little more rowdy with your questions. <laughs>